Hey, welcome back, Faithful Politics listeners and viewers. If you're watching on our YouTube channel, I am your political host, Will Wright, and I'm joined by my friend and faithful host, Pastor Josh Bertram. Hey, Josh. Oh, you call me a friend, Will. I really appreciate that. <laughs> Don't get used to it. How's it going? <laughs> <laughs> um, this week, we are talking with uh, Curtis Chang. Um, he is the founder of Redeeming Babel, an organization that addresses three underlying theological problems driving the chaos and confusion of our current world. And those problems are a mistaken spirituality of anxiety, a missing theology of organization, and a misshapen approach to politics. He's also the author of the book, The Anxiety Opportunity, How Worry is the Doorway to Your Best Self, and has a new and exciting initiative, which I'm really, really excited about, called The After Party, Towards Better Christian Politics, which equips evangelicals to pursue a biblically faithful approach to politics that offers a hopeful alternative to the polarization currently besetting so many communities. So welcome to the show, Curtis. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. So, so okay. Um, how did you get into this line of work? You know, I, I really, really shortened your CV. Um, and I know that you've had a pretty full career doing all sorts of things to include like recognition by the Obama White House. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious, how does one choose the path that you have walked? Well, I, I don't know if it's, I chose it or it was chosen for me. And I also don't know if it's impressive or it's just the, <laughs> the uh, kind of a, you know, a, a, a CV that almost looks like uh, attention deficit disorder. I don't know. Uh, but, uh, you know, I would, I hope that, you know, we all construct narratives of, uh, our past that we hope is uh, informed by God's spirit moving in us and through us and around us. The way I would try to construct that narrative to bring some uh, hopefully um, God orchestrated order out of, like I said, it could just seem, seem a little random, is I, I feel like I've had three career stages. So my first career stage was squarely in ministry. So I can relate very much to the work that Josh does. I started out in campus ministry and then uh, became nice. the past senior pastor of an evangelical covenant church in California. So that was my first, uh, you know, first probably, what, 10 years, more, a little more than a decade, um, was just in squarely in the world of ministry. I ended that, or it was ended for me, because uh, I basically flamed out. I had a breakdown due to anxiety, which is why I wrote the book uh, mm. recently on, called The Anxiety Opportunity, uh, and addressing sort of why I thought I, I sort of fell into uh, an anxiety breakdown, and in particular, why the church, uh, the broader Christian culture, has a misshapen approach to anxiety and how that was part of the problem for me. So anyways, that was, uh, that's what led to the end of career stage number one. Career stage number two was forming my own consulting firm that serves secular institutions, so secular nonprofits and government agencies. So for the, I've been doing that since 2007, so call that for the next 15 awesome. years or so. Uh, I was squarely in the world of secular institutions and serving them. Um, and then about five years ago, I felt like God was bringing me into uh, what I hope was a God-ordained sort of midlife crisis, which was asking like, wait a minute. So I've had career stage number one, career stage number nice. two. Is God, I just felt God pulling me to try to make sense of those two career stages and actually integrate them for the particular challenges of the fit church facing now. Because I do believe that one of the central challenges facing at least you know, broadly speaking, the American evangelical church, lowercase e, kind of in the traditional theological sense of the word evangelical, um, is that we have a misshapen uh, relationship with the broader secular world and the secular institutions. So as somebody who ministers and knows that world deeply, as in my career stage number two, as somebody who knows also the world of secular institutions uh, and government agencies in my career stage number two, I started to discern that God may be inviting me to play a bridge role in repairing what I think is a broken, fracturing relationship between the between the church and the broader secular world, and especially the world of secular institutions, including political institutions. So we can talk more about how you know that story, but that's basically, I think, the best way to make some sense of who I am and my career arc. 
I love it. it. It sounds to me like the story of Joseph a little bit in the sense that the things that he went through, not that you told your brothers you were going to rule over them. Maybe you did, but I'm and not, I'm not implying that. has accused me of anything related to what the accusations that Joseph has <laughs> faced also. Let me, let me be clear about that. Oh, that's so. funny. Well, I mean, what I mean is that like the things early in life prepared you, it sounds like, for what you're doing now, right? You have these distinct pieces of your life, you know, Potiphar's house that probably prepared Joseph to get there and do some administration yeah. in Egypt and see the, you know, the different things that were going on. So I'm just, you know, in those, and you can trace that kind of arc in his story. And it's just fascinating to, to see how you've come, like brought these things together. And I definitely want to dig into these three things and talk about how they apply and, yeah. and where we see them in our life. But, but really I want to, I, I kind of want to ask, where did the stroke of insight come where you said, oh, these are three major issues yeah. and I've experienced them in my life. And how did that like, how did that come about? Were you writing? Did you wake up like whatever the guy who did the uh, periodic table? He had a dream where he woke <laughs> up or something and saw it and it was all there. And he just wrote it down as quick as he could. What was that eureka yeah. moment like? It's a great, how, it, when did you come to it? Yeah, that's a great question, Josh. And I wish I could say, you know, I just went off on a retreat and it all became crystal clear and I sketched it all out. <laughs> it wasn't like that at all. It was, um, it was, I, which is, I think, more normal or more usual to how God reveals his sort of plan for us is that it comes yeah. over time as you um, and the pieces start falling into place. And um, really, the, actually, in terms of the three pieces, um, you know, I, I, and it, in some ways, the um, anxiety piece, I think, is most personally relevant to people. Like it most has touched people like, oh, oh yeah. it's a very deep personal issue if you suffer from anxiety that that it's, it touches on, you know, it's on the deepest parts of one's inner being. And so, Absolutely. so yeah. I think that topic, you know, touches people in the inner being. Our, our work on politics obviously touches at a macro level, at a social level, and, it, and especially, you know, in 2024 is going to be dominating the head public headlines. Um, interestingly, the the level of those three that I care probably the most about and actually was the original impetus for starting Redeeming Babel and, and, and this third career arc is actually that third level of or organizations, or you might say institutions. Because I, I, that really was my sort of passion, and it still is in many ways my passion project, is helping mm. Christians think about institutions, and, and including political institutions, but not just political institutions, including how they think about their, the, the companies they work for, um, uh, especially that's because I think especially Christians don't have a good sense of how to make spiritual sense of of the everyday organizations that actually shape their lives They're, they they don't have a spiritual theological lens uh to do that and that actually causes problems both at the macro social level uh because we end up having a, a significant distrust of institutions because we don't have a theological story to tell about institutions um, so we end up just distrusting them and you know, in our personal lives, our lives end, end up kind of getting evacuated of full meaning of God's purposes for our individual personal lives because so much of our personal lives are shaped by the, the companies we work for, the schools we attend, the uh, clubs that we are part of. And, you know, all these, our, our lives are actually profoundly institutional. But again, um, uh, we don't have a language. We don't have a framework. We don't have a story to make sense of organizations. So um, it's kind of the most nerdy of the, the institutions is kind of the most nerdy uh, sort of take on it. And it's the one that most people immediately are like, okay, anxiety, I get. Politics, of course, is a big issue. Institutions, huh? But for me, it's actually the middle ground. It's, it's the connective tissue between the personal and the broad macro social. And so that's why I think all three levels are important. I don't think you can understand all of what Christians are struggling with today if you don't have a a word, a perspective on all three of these levels at the individual level, you know, with anxiety at our sort of immediate uh, community level in terms of institutions and at the broad social level in terms of politics. So they all play on one another. You can't understand politics if you don't understand the anxiety that's driving it. You can't understand politics if you don't understand the institutions that, that's driving it. You know, it, it all it's you can't understand institutions if you don't understand the, the pervasive institutional anxiety that that actually is gripping so many of our organizations. So uh, 
you know, they're, we divide it out in three levels, but in reality, they're, they're all quite integrated. Wow. Um, okay, so I wanna, I wanna ask you about the after party. Um, yeah. So this is a new initiative that you guys are, are um, on, on uh, releasing. I'm not really quite sure the word yeah, I'm looking releasing. for. releasing. <laughs> That's a good word. <laughs> releasing to the Unleashing world. Releasing on the uh, world. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, and and it's 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 designed to to kind of help bridge the gap between politics mm -hmm. and Christianity. Am I getting that right? Yeah. It's well. I would say it, it's not bridging the gap. It's trying to heal the the toxic ways in which cur Christians currently are conditioned to think about and participate in politics. So this is the after party, and the subtitle to uh, the tagline is "Towards Better Christian Politics," um, and it's an initiative that David French, Russell Moore, and I have launched. And uh, when you know we've actually already launched it, it will be it will it, it's been beta testing in Ohio, and it will have its national launch on January 16th in 2024. Um, for those of you listeners who come from a sort of evangelically-ish, or not even, I mean, I would say even just many church traditions, you might have heard of a program called Alpha. Um, so Alpha is a, is a curriculum that actually equips churches for evangelism. It's a plug and play six session video course. It's, it's international. Basically, it is the leading curriculum um, that takes small groups through a curriculum where seekers and Christians, non-Christians can together talk about faith, explore faith. Um, so I don't know if you guys have heard of it, but it, it's actually quite common. Um, and so the way for those I, who I have heard it, of it, it's awesome. Ever, yeah. So the way I would say is what Alpha did for evangelism the after party wants to do for politics. And so, you know, it's to create a plug and play curriculum that churches, pastors can use in their settings, Christian colleges or families, whatever, so that you can come together and give you, get a framework for talking about politics in a way that does not divide, polarize and, and shut down the conversation, but actually begins the conversation and actually helps restore broken connections um, because that the political polarization one is tearing apart many churches and uh, across the country it's in, in quite devastating fashion I know you guys uh, had Tim Alberta on as a guest and he's documented this right about how much politics has one divided the church and also drawn the church into political engagement that could drive tear apart our country it has already caused enormous damage to our country. Um, and so we are trying to uh, inject some some good good biblical uh, antidote to uh, this virus of toxic polarization, fear, and division. You know, kind of staying in that same vein, that, that medical vein, um, assuming you're a doctor of divinity, um, what, what would you say is, you know, causing, you know, this, this virus to, or may, I'll, I'll, I'll go back even further. Like what started it and what's, yeah. con, what's causing it to perpetuate or to yeah. continue? I, I think the disease metaphor, and it's a metaphor, but you know, I think the disease metaphor is actually quite apt in this case, because with so many of diseases that get truly catastrophic, it's not one thing. There are often underlying conditions. You know, you had high blood pressure. You had, uh, you know, uh, you were overweight. Like this is, and then there's a triggering event or a triggering uh, acute event that, like, then suddenly it becomes a cascading set of of interlocking <clears throat> um, dynamics that really is what causes, you know, truly catastrophic diseases. And I think that's actually a good framework to think about <clears throat> what has happen to, again, at least the broadly speaking, in, in using the, as the broadest term as possible, the broad American evangelical church, that you had deep underlying conditions uh, that were part, uh, as part of it. And I would list as some of these deep underlying conditions is uh, you had a, uh, a under, a really misshapen way of thinking of how Christians ought to relate to the rest of the world, that it was conditioned on fear, conditioned on a sense of persecution, uh, uh, a sense of they're out to get us. Um, and so that was already there. That's been there for decades. Um, and that's, that's kind of, that, that's been a, if you will, a virus that's been circulating in the evangelical DNA for decades. 
you had also a, um, I would say, a business model in the evangelical world that it was based on scale and mass, that you, you needed to build a big market, build brand recognition, uh, build big churches so that you have a lot of giving units uh, in your church that could support a big staff size. Like that's, that's been the evangelical model. And the people we uphold in our popular evangelical culture are the people who've built, succeeded in that model, built big mega churches. This is why, Josh, I really appreciate your, your church model that is trying to steer away from that because I think there's a lot of dangers in our standard mm. evangelical business model that then causes basically the leaders, it tempts them greatly to think, what do I need to give to the masses so that I can build a big church, right? So it, it's rather, you, become, you become a shepherd that doesn't lead your sheep, but rather is taking your cues from the sheep uh, on how to actually get them. That would be, I think, another endemic thing that's in present evangelical that then, uh, so you put, let's just, let's just stop there as two underlying chronic things that, that prevail in the evangelical church. Then you enter a broader um, moment in our cultural social history where politics already is greatly polarized, where you have, um, you know, very toxic uh, sort of sense of us versus them. Uh, add the pandemic to that where the churches perceive the government indeed is coming after them. And with some, you know, not completely unfounded, but some some shreds of where that echoes. And then suddenly it becomes a cascading series of events where it's like everything starts fitting together, right? In a, in a negative sense, in a cascading sense, where you have broader, broad polarization it, it, that further intensifies the sense of, you know, evangelical distrust of, of broader society, political institutions, that they are out to get us. And then, uh, because that's being activated in our, in our masses, you have figures that are like, okay, how do I feed that? How do I actually even turn that to my advantage so that I can actually attract people to my ch church? And Tim Alberta, again, has documented this brilliantly in his book, The Kingdom, The Power, and The Glory, how there's an industry that stokes up fear um, in the evangelical church, stokes up distrust as a business model, frankly, um, that and, and using, now using politics to do that, that further intensifies this extremism. I'll actually add one third underlying chronic condition that I think is being exposed and being triggered here, which is in reality, the evangelical church has done a, I would say, a poor job of deeply, deeply forming our people in Christ that uh, at, a, at a deep fundamental level, right? So we, because in reality, that big business model that we were talking about, that is about the masses, that does not form people. The big, and I'm speaking as somebody who, you know, was a pastor of a church that tried to follow this model. The big church model of the big Sunday flash splashy event that essentially, uh, David French and I talk about this, is essentially a TED Talk plus Coldplay concert as the method of spiritual formation, right? Talk with big, great worship experience. That does not actually form our people. Um, it it kind of keeps them going and attending, you know, but it doesn't form our people. And actually what forms mm. our people then more deeply is secular media, secular social media, secular news media, and so forth. So what this is all has been revealed is that we can, even the pastors that I, I think, and I think a lot of the pastors, uh, I would say the vast majority of the pastors don't want their churches to go. I mean, there's, there is a minority that, that are, are playing the game of the, of the fear mongering, but I think a lot of them don't want to play that, but they haven't formed their people to resist the broader secular forces that are forming them through on left and right of, 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 of political polarization. And so our people are now getting formed in their politics much more by secular forces than by the, by the tr a true teaching of Jesus and the Bible. And it, it's revealing um, the deficiencies that have been there for decades, I would say much longer than decades, of, of lack of spiritual formation. And so that's why you get all of these uh, pastors and churches, even if they're not stoking up the fear, they're playing catch up. They're playing, they're, they don't know yeah. what to do with it. Um, and they're trying to, trying to yeah. white knuckle their way uh, by not talking about politics um, uh, because they know about policy. I'm sorry. Politics. Talk about policy, but not politics. Yeah. Or, right? or even, I would say, actually, I would say probably the majority of of pastors don't even want to talk about policy. They just, they actually, yeah, I would say, right. <laughs> they don't, they want to stay out of it entirely because they know 
The yes. moment they say something on Monday morning, their email boxes are going to be filled with the 10 or 20 percent that are coming after them right on the left and the right. And so so I would say the majority yes. of, of evangelical pastors are white knuckling their way through election seasons, hoping this doesn't come up. But it's that's not again, we're seeding the formation then to secular forces in that way. We're not forming yes. our people. We've we've given that up that ground. And so we then become just further um, tinder that uh, part that secular partisan forces will grab at to throw on the fires of division. And so we've got to change that. And that's what the after party is doing. The after party is trying to provide curriculum and a play, a play for the pastors to run that they can run without them having to take, go stand up on Sunday morning, preach a sermon that is just absolutely going to 100% going to be misinterpreted and mis misunderstood by at least 20% of the population, you know, their congregation. And then they're fighting out that fire and then they vow, I'm never going to preach about politics again. Because the Sunday morning service yeah. is the wrong, wrong setting in the typical church to deal with this. We're trying to provide a set of curriculum and experiences that I think is a much better suited for uh, the setting that is conducive, more conducive to addressing these politics, which is really more in small group embodied right. face to face communities. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, we are a pretty small community and we went through a political. It was a it was through the Colossian Forum and it yeah. was a great folks. political Bible yeah. study. And it was yeah. great. It, it was awesome. Yeah. We really enjoyed it and but even in this small group of people that really cared about each other people are like i'm getting i'm getting tired of talking about political yeah. stuff because i think even the very the very concepts and topics are draining well and, and here's i'm sorry go ahead oh, go ahead oh well, well I, when i was i, I yeah. do have a question yeah but go ahead speak on that comment on that if you want well i think the reason why uh one of the reasons why i think it has been draining is because substantively uh, even the, um, I think many of the, I think more healthy approaches to Christian politics have still bought into an underlying approach to talking about Christian politics that I think is the mm. wrong approach, or at least the wrong main approach. And that's what I would distinguish the what of politics from the how of politics. So by the what of politics, I mean a specific ideology, a party and policy, right? That's the what of like, what are the pos substantive yeah. positions? And Christian approach to politics has been overwhelmingly defined by the what, right? Like what party is yes. the more Christian what party? What are we against? What, what yes, are we for? What policy are we for and what policy are we against? What ideology is more uh, Christian than, than the other? And it immediately puts you in a divided uh, us versus them Absolutely. You know, sort of road, right? Even if you're trying to be like not as crazy uh, divisive uh, as on, on the far right or the far left, the moment you're like locked into politics is about the what you're immediately pitted into an, uh, uh, an oppositional stance. What Christians have have forgotten, have missed is politics is as much. And I would say actually more politics is more about the how, like, mm. how do you how do you relate to one another? How do you actually resolve things? How do you actually uh, uh, think about things. How do you relate to, to how do you relate to disputes? Like it's rather Absolutely. than ideology, it's about the how, the what of ideology versus the how of spiritual values, the what of parties versus the how of relationships, the what of policies mm. versus the how of practices. Right. So the how of spiritual values, of of uh, relationships and of practices that actually can bring people together because it's it's the same thing we're about relationships we're talking about spiritual values these are things we can share not be divided upon and we forget that politics is as much about the how as it is the what and and this is key this is key that jesus was much much more clear about the mm. how of politics than the what i mean yes. look at the sermon on the mount try to draw from the sermon on the mount an immigration policy, a policy on immigration, you know, like yeah. you can't, I mean, you can draw, yeah. you can draw some fuzzy inferential lines that is, that will be contested and is debatable. Right. But Absolutely. you try to draw a straight line from Jesus to forgive your enemies, extend mercy, go the extra mile, be committed to truth, hum humility, like those how virtues 
Those are crystal clear in the teachings of Jesus. And Jesus was very clear about all this and lived it out in his life. He died for the how of politics, refusing to take up arms against his enemy, right? And forgiving his enemy, even as he was being crucified by his enemy. He staked his life on a how of politics. He did yes. not stake his life on the policy debates of first century uh, Israel, right? right. He, he in, instead, in fact, resolutely refused to get drawn into the zealots versus the the tax collectors. In fact, he said, no, no, I'm going to have both of those in my party, in my Jesus right. party, Simon and Matthew, right? So, so Jesus embodied this, you know what? Politics is not going to be about the defining what's of the day. Politics is going to be about a new how that is centered around my very being and my very lordship, right? Uh, over, all, over all things, over all peoples. And so what the after party is trying to do is to shift our Christian uh, emphasis and preoccupation on politics from Mm. the what to the how. And that's the crucial move. I love that. I love that. I think that's so good. And when you were talking like before this, um, just this previous response, when you're talking just a little while ago, I was thinking about how so many people have been discipled by uh by someone but it isn't jesus so many That's christians right. have been discipled yeah. by uh dennis prager they've yep. been discipled by ben shapiro yep they've been discipled by i i don't know name name any of the other right. you know matt walsh all these guys now again yeah. I, I i don't have anything like uh, i mean not my my point is not to say that you shouldn't allow yourself to be influenced by those people, but you should think critically about what they say and not just accept it. Or what? Who, who's the new guy um, that everyone loves? The guy from Canada. I don't know why I'm forgetting his name. Uh, it's not. Oh man, like Jordan Peterson. There you go. Oh yes, and Jordan yeah. Peterson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, yeah. definitely Jordan Peterson, dude. So, so I see this all the time, and. One of the, what, I had this really long discussion with a really close person to me who happens to actually be pastor of a fairly large church. And we were talking about fear. And we were talking yeah. about this idea. It was like a quote from Machiavelli. I'm going to butcher it. But basically, if you control people's fears, Absolutely. you control their soul. Yep, and so totally. when you're talking about anxiety, yeah. Right. And the mistaken spirituality of anxiety. I love the words. I love what that evokes, like in in the in the sense of thinking, what does that mean? So how do you see it manifesting specifically in Christian churches today? And what do you think the implications for spiritual growth is within that? Like, what is what is the antidote in a sense to that spirituality of anxiety? Yeah, that's such a great question. And and this is exactly why I wrote the book, The Anxiety Opportunity, and we, we released our video course on anxiety um, before we touched politics. Because you actually have to establish that. You have to give people a mm. way to deal with their anxiety in a biblical-centric way, because otherwise they will turn to politics. In this particular moment, they will t- politics is Xanax for Christian anxiety, you know? <laughs> that's that's what it is, you know. Conspiracy yeah, theories, <laughs> Trump, uh, you know, at least on the on the right, uh, are are the Xanax for Christian anxiety. They're looking for conspiracy theory is a way for you for anxiety. One way to describe anxiety is uncertainty about the f- uncertainty about the future, right? What is a conspiracy theory? It's saying I know for certain what is going to happen in the future, right? That's what a conspiracy. That's what QAnon is, um, and so it's like if that, right. that's why it fits so well. If you have pervasive anxiety, you're going to look for some drug to relieve that anxiety and conspiracy theory at least offers a short hit just like xanax does a short hit it's like oh this is why things are bad and this is what's going to happen Mm. on blank blank date until those things don't happen on blank blank date and then you have to take that drug again for the updated new new prediction that will give you that sense of certainty right so this is the interlocking ways in which anxiety and political uh disease uh, are so interlinked um so what are the how do you let's let's see if we can connect the dots even further here so one of the i would say one of the central pervasive 
misformations about anxiety in the Christian circles is that anxiety is wrong. Anxiety is a sin or anxiety is a mm. character flaw, right? This is why if you, you're not lacking, you're lacking faith uh, if, you, if you have anxiety. That's why we need to pray anxiety away. So anxiety is viewed as something that is wrong. Now, again, that's actually in, that's a completely incorrect picture of anxiety. And why do we know that? Well, you can read the book, but just really quickly, read Gethsemane. Read the Gethsemane story of Jesus. Jesus himself experienced anxiety. He was distressed Definitely. in spirit. He was sweating. He was like, he was, you know, so there's no, there, there's, there's no Christian vi vision that actually can uphold the notion that anxiety is a sin when Jesus himself mm. experienced it. It's human. It's part of the human condition. And what is it at its essence? Anxiety is the fear of loss. Like if you think of mm. any anxiety you have, it's because you fear some loss that will that may ha that that you fear will happen in the future, right? So if you have health anxiety, it's not about something that's happening right now. It's something that you fear will happen about your body or that you will lose some function in your body or your relational anxiety. What will somebody so-and-so think about me in the future, right? It's all about some feared loss we have in the future. So if we say that Christians should not feel anxious, that it's a sin to be anxious, that you should be able to pray away anxiety, really what you are saying is, you should that God should be able to provide for you, or you should be able to acquire some life that is insured against loss. That's what we're saying when you say you can't feel anxiety. You're saying you cannot. You should be able to not experience loss in the future. Now let's connect the dots to politics. When you ask political theorists what is the essence of democracy, uh, American democracy. One of the crucial things is what's called loser's consent. That basically means like, hey, we have to, democracy is a way for us to experience loss. That one side is going to lose, right? And they have to consent to it and be okay with it. Uh, and that's actually how, and, and be, go for the next election. And because no one party will have absolute power, you'll always have another chance. It's a, democracy is a way at a broad social level to manage loss, to make loss acceptable. Right for everybody, so that we don't think any election is an existential is life or death struggle. Right, so now put those pieces together. If Christians have been conditioned to think you cannot possibly experience loss, loss, you know, you you because because if you're feeling anxious, it means it's like there's something must happen to make that fear of loss go away. Then you're going to look for a politics that is like all about how do I make my feared loss not happening. So you will then be attracted to false promises, uh, authoritarian leaders that say, elect me and I will ensure that you will never experience any loss and we will defeat all of your opponents. You won't, you can't lose, right? Because I'm your, I'm your victor that will protect you from loss. Um, so that's why Christians are so, especially evangelical and I would say conservative Christians, where this anxiety as sin, anxiety as something you should pray away is so pervasive, are also the same populations um, including, I would say, Pentecostal traditions. I would say, I would put this as well, where this, you know, faith, have faith, prayed away, uh, pro almost prosperity gospel-ish kind of theology is so pervasive. There's a mapping of those uh, church traditions that that, at the, that treat anxiety as something that you cannot, you should not, you, that should be, you know, put away from life to politics that also cannot tolerate loss, that if you lose an election, we'll storm the Capitol. I mean, I'm, I'm being you know, rhetorically uh, sort of provocative here, I know, but that's, that, that's, the, that's the line you draw, right? Between good. the fact that we don't, we can't tolerate loss in our personal lives, right? So we can't tolerate loss in our political lives. Uh, I'm gonna go back to, to the what and how, but, but before, before I do that, I wanna kinda just give you some context because I came to the faith much later in life, uh, 2008. I, I gave my life to Christ at the altar, uh, my um, like the the wedding altar, because uh, mm -hmm. my my wife um, is a believer. Her dad's a pastor. Um, I I don't know. I I talked a good enough game to probably make her think I was a Christian. <laughs> um, and uh, she said yes. And you know we've been married since 2008. But but. Before that, I, I was born and raised in Southern California, grew up there very, um, I, I grew up very liberal, 
um, politically. Mm-hmm. And when I came to Christ, it wasn't like I just left, yeah, like all that at you know at the altar. I was like I was still me. It's just yeah. I I kind of had a, a a me that was fueled by by a different fuel source. Um, yeah. Not not so much the world, but but yeah. but God and. Um, you know, one of the things I learned when I, when I did become a believer is that, um, it wasn't all like rainbows and unicorns because there's a lot of Christians that I, I met and knew that had their own idea about what it meant to be a Christian. And one of them was not to be a progressive, (laughs) like Democrat. Right. Right. Uh, I mean, I remember telling my, my pastor, um, at, um, the church we're going to near, near Seattle, you know, that I voted for Obama. And and I had a talking to <laughs> about yeah. that. Like, yeah. You voted for Obama, you know, like yeah. oh he's he believes in killing babies and you know like yeah. uh, gay uh, same sex marriage and blah 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 blah. You know, and I'm just like no, like I no, I I, I don't feel str- like like that that just wasn't where where I was at politically, yeah. morally, yeah. whatever. So like how do you how do you have conversations with people when when they you know, especially other believers, when they already kind of view you as not really quite Christian, like you're almost there, but, you yeah. know, you just have to, you know, vote Republican once in, in an election, and then you can kind of get a little bit closer to, to you know, being where, where we are. Uh, so, yeah. like, how do you have conversations with people like that? Well, that's what we were trying to do with the after party and its curriculum is, is I think it's very hard to have those conversations in a completely unstructured manner um, where you're just having to like navigate the conversation on the fly, bring it up kind of randomly or something like it's just, it's very hard, right? Cause these are personal issues. Yes. And, and people have, most Christians have not been trained uh, and given a way to talk about politics other than the kind of knee jerk equations that they've inherited that of course all Christians are Republicans or all Christians are Democrats, right? One way, one way or another. And, so I do think we need to give people a, some structure and context and guardrails um, and frameworks and language, like all of it, right? Like we need to teach. We need to teach and inform our people on how to talk about politics. We can't just expect them to do it on their own because on their own, they will adopt the world's methods. And when we become Christians, we are supposed to leave behind our prevailing uh, dominant allegiances to the world's ways. And we have a new Lord. We have a new identity as a follower of Jesus. And so the way we talk about politics has got to look different than the way the world teaches and thinks about politics. And so, again, that's why we're trying to do the after party, because I think we need help. I think people need help and need a structure, need a, need a program to go through, not to just t- suddenly tell them what they think, but like just in the way that Alpha does, it creates a space a context, some ground rules, some language, some starting concepts to help people have this conversation um, that both that people who might disagree can agree to and say, okay, we're going to talk about it through this way. I think that's a lot safer way uh, for most people anyways than just to navigate it on the fly uh, in individual relationships. I think that's there's very few people that can pull that off well, I think. Yeah, I totally agree with you. You know, I had a mentor of mine that would give some of the best advice. He gave some of the best advice I ever got. And the advice was when you need to have a conversation about something really difficult, have a conversation about the conversation. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like you're, it's like, because right, the need to frame something and prepare someone emotionally for the changes that are going to occur and they just need to understand this is going to be hard from the beginning and these are the things to look out for i think it's i think it's so 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 important and you know when you're thinking about the organization side of all this because you had mentioned earlier and and, and stated that really the the organization and the theology of organization yeah is missing and it's like central yeah. I would love for you to 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 dive into that a sure. little bit more, drill down on that, and specifically, like what, how do you feel like the effectiveness and the mission of Christian institutions, or if you're moving over even to secular institutions, 
Yeah. How can this theology of organization, whether yeah. we're running them or how we view them, how can the gap be bridged? What is the gap? Yeah. Maybe you can help us understand better what is the gap. Sure. And then how can it be bridged through yeah. what you guys are doing? Here's the way that I would try to help people identify the gap, what's missing in our understanding of institutions, which is to ask the very simple question, what is an institution? Is, is it, is it hmm. something human? Is it, does it actually, does the, or let's put it in the most uh, specific theological language, does a human institution or human organization, does it bear the image of God? Is it an image bearer? Or is it just an inanimate hmm. tool? Is it a thing? Is it a being or is it a thing? Now, most Christians and most, frankly, most non-Christians also have actually been conditioned to think of organizations as things, as tools, right? That they're not, they're not human. They're just, they're, 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 they're a thing, right? And so when you don't think of the, when you don't locate the or human organization, and that's what it is, it's a human organization, it's made of human beings. When you don't locate it in the category of image bearer, image bearer of God, but you locate it in the category of thing, of object, that immediately puts you down a different path. Because what do we do with what, like if with a hammer, right? These days, when a hammer, when a tool, a thing is broken, what do we do with it generally? Well, they're so cheap, we just throw them away. We get another one on Amazon or Home Depot or whatever like that. We don't, that's what we do with things these days. We just, if they're broken, that means darn hammer, we throw it out, right? Um, now, we don't do that with our, uh, you, do, would you, you wouldn't do that with your kid. You wouldn't do that with a friend, right? Because like, no, they're human. They're an image bearer. If, if they're broken, we don't just throw them out. We actually seek to repair them. We seek to repair them. We seek to repair the relationship, right? So you see how we go down two different very paths of reaction. Now, why that's important is because we live in an era where for larger, for larger structural reasons, so many of our institutions are broken. They are broken. They are not functioning well. They are not doing well. Uh, and again, there's a longer story for why that's the case, but, that, but especially our political institutions right now are fractured. The both parties, I would say, are broken. Congress certainly is completely broken in ability to get anything done. Um, so at various levels, we experience rightly that institutions are broken. And especially if you start thinking about, you know, uh, how institutions may have mistreated us, have not granted us perhaps as much understanding as Christians or made room for our particular views on, say, sexuality or something like that, then yes, you know, there's some, there's some legitimate ways we experience institutions as broken. Now then, here's the question. What do you do with that experience and reality of broken institutions? Do we just throw them out? Do we just further dismiss them, reject them, avoid them? Or, 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 or again, usually what we do is we throw them out. We tear them down even further. Um, mm -hmm. Or do we seek their redemption? Do we participate? Do we do we actually double down on our relationship to those institu broken institutions, knowing that they are made in the image of God and therefore participate in God's grand story of redemption, and that we then are characters in that story of redemption, not just at the human individual level, but at the human collective level of organ. And that's what institutions are. They're just humans at a collective level, right? And so if we, so this is why this is crucial, I think, because you can't understand politics. With, unless you understand institutions. That's what politics, politics is conditioned through institutions. You also can't experience our, understand our own individual lives, actually, and our anxieties that we experience without understanding institutions, because it's, it's institutions sometimes that are making us anxious, our work, our church, our, our club, our school, and so forth like that. And so we need a way to think about institutions rightly. And I believe the biblical uh, vision of the human institution is that it is just the human in the collective. It is the human made in the image of God um, it, it, at a collective level. This is why in Colossians 1, 1, you know, it talks about the powers of principalities and rulers and authorities that were made in him and through him and for him. It's part that those are collective terms. Those are institutional terms, powers, rulers, authorities, right? That in Colossians and other parts of scripture, it's clear those are also made in, through, and for Jesus. Those are, those are 
part of his image, part of how human beings reflect the image of God. We reflect the image of God, not just as isolated individuals, but also in the collective. I mean, that's, that's what the church is, right? So secular organizations are there in their own way, collective image bearing um, uh, beings. And if we then start thinking about our broken institutions, including our broken political institutions, as actually fragile, fragile fallen image bearers, right? Fragile fallen image bearers, then our posture toward them is different. It's not condemnation, not suspicion, not rejection, not further tearing down. It's actually, oh, these are beings that are in need of redemption. And perhaps God has assigned me a role in that redemptive story for that particular organization. It just changes our, our whole posture and, and all of the actions that follow from that. So that's why that this middle ground of uh, giving Christians a theology of institutions, I think is a critical missing piece. Wow, so I wanna give you like two examples. So in one example, you've got President Biden, um, Catholic, you know, news reporters catch him like going to church every Sunday or whatnot. And then you've got like um, the newly elected um, House Speaker Mike Johnson, um, mm -hmm. who is a Christian and you know uses terms like you know um, God gave me a vision that I'm supposed to be like Moses, part the Red Sea, all this other kind of stuff. Um, and and I I'd love to kind of get your thoughts about the role of politicians using. Um, or us understanding their relationship to God and whether or not you think that's a good thing or a bad thing. Because uh, I'll, I'll tell you just for me, I mean, like my, my own sort of human spirit is like, like, okay, that's the right way. That's the wrong way to sort of like, you know, declare your, your faith. And, and that's not necessarily right. I mean, I, I, I understand sort of the fallacy behind that, but, but, you know, I, I look at somebody like Mike Johnson and it could just be party affiliation. You know, I'm like, wow, like, like he should not be doing this kind of in the name of Jesus um, because it just gives a bad taste to, you know, everything. You know, like, like if you are a non-believer, you're not going to come to Christ because of something Mike Johnson said, did, or whatever. But there's a good chance you, you will do your best to kind of just do an about face and go the other way as fast as you can. But then you look at, like, President Biden, and you're like, he, you know, he, he'll use scripture every once in a while in a speech, but... It, it does seem for him that it's a very private, you know, personal sort of um, relationship he has with religion. So so I'd love to just kind of just hear your thoughts about how politicians use sort of their, their faith in the public sphere. I think the biggest danger is when politicians recruit Jesus to support a partisan identity and loyalty versus submitting our politics to Jesus. Right. So. Um, that's the key question to ask, because if Jesus is, re is truly Lord, then Jesus is going to tr way transcend our, our, low, our lower case loyalties and allegiances to specific human parties, which are by definition broken and fallen. Like we've just talked about that, right? Like once you locate the Democratic Party and the Republican Party as image bearers that are fallen, fallen image, then we're like, then you also, not only, so, so I, because if you don't have a proper theology of institutions like with the particular parties, you will either re throw them out as, as, uh, you know, as broken things and dismiss them, or you will way over elevate them as your savior. Like you go one of two directions. You, you either expect too little or, 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 or give them too little meaning, or you give them way too much meaning and way too much authority. You, be, you either make them an idol or you make them a thing you throw out into the refuse team. And often by the ways, they're the same, they become the same because what happens is if you elevate a institution to godlike authority, like to the, to the authority that defines who you are, they eventually let you down. They will, they, will not come, they will not be able to come through. Idols will not, will not deliver on their promises. And then you throw them out, right? And then you, and what happens oftentimes is they're like, oh, that idol, that party uh, didn't fall through. I'm going to go switch in the other direction and find a new idol, right? Versus realizing, wait a minute, these are just human cons constructs made in the image of God, but not God himself. That's an image of God is something that points to God, but is not God. When you make the mistake of an image bearer, making that image bearer a god, that's called idolatry, right? When we make image 
images God himself. And so any political move that that makes that doesn't recognize our parties are at best fallen, broken image bearers, just like just like any individual is fallen and broken. Uh, and we take our cues, we take all of our identity uh, a, a, a from that being, that entity, uh, then we're practicing idolatry, right? We're, and then we, and then the worst kind of idolatry is one that somehow actually is hidden, is a is a more hidden idolatry because we've sort of covered it over with God talk, when in reality what we're doing is baptizing an idol, a human a, a human allegiance, and we're we're baptizing it with some God language. That's the most dangerous. That's the most that's the most you know yeah. distorted view way in which religion and politics mix. Yeah, and and I've seen them mix like that, obviously, quite a bit. And as I'm thinking about organizations being image bearers, such a fascinating concept, and I and I love the idea. I think it's really a robust concept, honestly, to kind of produce a lot of thinking and research and and contemplating on this idea and biblical research on on you know what what is the difference i think it's worth pursuing that mm -hmm. because i guess when i'm thinking like about myself you know i have i i do something i i i make a decision and then i pay for the consequences of my decision right in an organization it doesn't seem though like it's that simple right that's right like there's there's more to it what kind of help us understand like okay we see the image bears but in what ways are organizations maybe even more crucial 100% um, because of yeah just kind of kind of bring out that because yeah no i i really like what you just said they're there they're a lot more yeah, yeah, yeah. they're they're more important one more of important the things that, that i think impact. why institutions are so important to god's design for humanity is it actually more not perfectly but more faithfully and more accurately represent the consequences of our decisions. Because the reality is every decision we make is not just about our individual. We, it, we, what Abs we do absolutely. affects others, right? And absolutely. it affects not only others around us, but it affects those to come, like, right? So, um, you know, this is why I'm pro-life is because we have a responsibility to the unborn, right? They are also part of what, so that, you know, this is the whole logic of pro-life is like, hey, when you make a decision about your pregnancy, it's not just about your own individual consequences. It has consequences that ripple on to the next generation, right? Even if they're not on board. Well, in the same way, um, I would say like climate change. Why, why, do, why am I pro-life and, and, and really take climate change seriously? Because I believe, for the, it's the same logic. I believe my consequences, I should not just be weighing what this affects me, but it should affect future generations to come, the unborn, right? I have a responsibility. Uh, I have, I, I have a, I'm in a covenant uh, relationship, even with those I don't see and those that are, are coming before me. Now, how do I live that out? How do I represent that um, in reality? That's where organizations and institutions, especially institutions, I would I would say this is where a theology of, uh, and institutions are crucial. And I would say what, a, what an institution is, is an organization that, that lasts beyond one generation. Right. That's what an institution is. It's a long standing organization. Why do we need human institutions that last beyond multiple generations? It's a way to capture this reality that as human beings, we have relationship with with those who are yet to come. Right. And so we need to act in a way that has a longer time frame and a longer scope of consequence than just my individual, like right now or my next year or my next, you know, or even my lifetime. And that's that's the beauty of institutions and why they reflect God's design for humanity is it's a way. So when we participate, it, you know, uh, we need institutions, for instance, like just to say, take the environment, like who's going to steward our land, right? Well, it's only going to be that there's an institution that's like, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm yeah. going to buy that land. I'm going to preserve it as a public park. Uh, I'm not going to develop it for my own immediate goal. I'm going to preserve this for the generations to come, right? That an individual can't do that. An institution, we need an institution, you right. know, a land trust, a stewardship, whatever, whatever you want to call it, uh, um, a foundation or something like that. And so 
institutions are that way that that reflects that we are not made in isolation and just for our particular moment in time. We are part of a broader community across space and time. Um, and, and that's what the church is. The church, that's what the church is. The church is an institution that spans generations to convey that God's work goes through the generations. And, and human institutions are, do that in their own way. And so that's why we need precisely um, to think of ourselves as, as institutional beings. Okay, so my last question for you, is, is, it's actually almost an unanswerable question, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Um, mm. And, and that's, that's if we were to look ahead, you know, a few generations in the future, um, how do you envision kind of the role of the Christian church evolving in the political sphere, especially given sort of the trajectory that, you know, we, we are already on? <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, I have no idea. From a, I have no idea from a predictive level of what's going to happen. Uh, I will say what I hope will happen is that Christians, uh, the true church, uh, doubles down on Jesus as our highest Lord, <laughs> as the Lord of Lords, as our highest authority that we take all of our cues from, and that all of our other cues that we take from secular media, from our partisan loyalties, get subjected to, are made subservient to our highest allegiance in Jesus. And I think where that will be most found is not that we change our what of politics, like the substance beliefs. So it doesn't mean that we all stop being one party or and start being another party. It's not going to be that. How you will know that Christians are increasingly truly following Jesus as Lord of all is when they start behaving on the how in a way that stands out from the world. When rather than cruelty, we are defined by love. Rather than division, we are d uh, defined by uh, a unity. Uh, when rather than defined by a, I got to protect my interests, we are defined by being coming the slave of all, the servant of all, as Jesus told John, James and John. Uh, you know, and so it's gonna it's gonna be when Christians' politics start looking just very different than the way it is now, because right now it looks exactly the same way as we are. Our politics have gotten hijacked, uh, and is now taking our cues from the secular partisan world. And so it, we'll know we're following Jesus. They'll know us by our love. They'll know us when mm. we are actually loving our enemies, loving our opponents, loving the broader public good more than we are insisting on having our way uh, be the only way. So I, I just have a thought, and then I, I this is my last question too, and then I'm sure we're going to ask a question about, you know, just kind of some practical stuff about how people can get involved and stuff sure. like that. But my last kind of deeper question here, exploratory question, is, and, and again, let me give just a little bit of context. We're going to be interviewing an author of a book. I won't say it right now because we'll do it in the podcast, but it's on power. And it's on the Christian's use of power. Mm -hmm. And... In that, the author makes the point, in which I've heard before, but I think he does a good job of showing it, that Christianity has the worst things about Christianity that in the past have been used, leveled against it as being hypocritical, because mm -hmm. it was at several points, right? Massively critical, mm -hmm. hypocritical. Um, but it was when they had power. Yeah. And when, 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 when Christians had power, they tended to do things that people with power do. Yeah. Um, and, and keep power. Absolutely. Uh, uh, subjugate people. Yep. Um, do everything they can to use political coercive power to get their yep. way. And yet when Christianity wasn't necessarily in power, what he says is you see some of the most, um, some of the most robust and profound movements for civil yep. rights. Yep. For for people around the world. Yep. So many. I mean, you can trace for evangelism. Why is the church growing yes. in China, communist China, of all places, where it is the most powerless? Right. Yeah, yeah. because it's influence. Absolutely. And yeah. because, wow, they're they're in the they're in the minority. They have no power and they're still believing this and they're still That's right. preaching this. And then I'm seeing that it's working. There's something here. Right. So my question is. Kind of, I, I'm going to ask you to give a call 
from your heart mm -hmm. to Christians and non-Christians. We have yeah. a lot of uh, people that would not consider themselves Christians in any way that listen to this podcast. And we have a lot of people that are very, very deeply evangelical Christian. Yep. Um, they probably, you can tell like some of the episodes I'm sure only evangelicals listen to. And then some of the other ones, like a bunch of the other people listen to just depending on what the topic is, but give a call from your heart, even from your experience in the, like working with secular institutions, leading Christian institutions and leading secular institutions, how give us some hope and sense of how can these these institutions find the best in each other and how can they work towards this new goal because it is going to take the church being in un, un, unity yeah. and changing the things you're talking about but it's also going to be the church in conversation and interaction with the world around it and giving that witness in a way that can be received yeah. so what, what what are your thoughts on that and kind of just give an appeal from your heart I'm um, not going to give an appeal. Last couple minutes. I'm not going to give an appeal. I'm going to give a prayer, and it's going to be the Lord's prayer. Uh, and I'm just going to re remind us, you know, how it ends. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Thine, or yours is not mine, not ours. Yours, thine. Uh, and we're talking about the Father in heaven. Jesus is redirecting us. Do not seek your own kingdom. Do not seek your own power. Do not seek your own glory. Discipline yourself through daily prayer, the Lord's prayer. Thine is the kingdom. Yours, Father. Yours, uh, Father God, is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. And that's what we need. We need to pray above all else. We need to pray for ourselves and to pray for our institutions, that our institutions would reflect uh, as best as they can. And this, this secular organizations will do it one way. Christian organizations and churches will do it another way with more explicitly. But all organizations and all people ensconced in organizations and all people, period, uh, whether they are. In, I mean, we're all in some organization, but all people, uh, we can pray this prayer. Uh, and if we can truly pray this prayer that we submit all of the earthly kingdoms, all of the earthly grasping for power, all of the earthly glories to God's kingdom power, truly, truly, not grabbing God's name and baptizing our own partisan or organizational kingdoms and powers and glories, but truly submit our the, the what we can wield and say, God, this is yours. This is truly yours. You are the highest allegiance. You reshape me and how I think about the world and how I think about the organism, my organization, how I think about politics. That's where, that's, that is the pathway. That is the pathway to discipleship. That's why Jesus taught his disciples, pray this regularly, pray this daily. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Mm, that's so good. Thank you so much, Curtis. Well said. Yeah. Um, well, how can people get in contact with your organization, with you? How can they get involved in what you're doing? And kind of give us a sense of the future and the projects that you have yeah. going on. So please check us out at after party that's after dash party dot org after hyphen or dash party dot org and you can learn more about how to get involved. The most immediate way you can get involved is think about starting a uh, if you're if you're a member of a small group or you're a leader of a small group, uh, we can fill if nothing else we can fill six weeks of your programming need. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, nice. hopefully we do hopefully do a lot better than that. But uh, it's a plug and play curriculum uh, that you, that is designed uh, to do all of what we just talked about, right? To help create a context, a formula, a, a framework for pe Christians to get their politics reformed in submission to Jesus, not on the what, but on the how. Um, and so you can find out there. And so, yeah, if you're a member of a small group or you're a leader of a small group or, you can, or you're an influencer in your church about what small group curriculum you'll go through, please check out afterparty.org, sign up, and get, get kind of more information on how you can be an advocate and a champion. Uh, you can take the course yourself if you want to check it out yourself as an individual before you advocate for it. You can do that. Um, so that's one huge way. And then look for and then sign up for our, to get our notices because we've got more coming. Uh, so the course gets nationally released on, Jan on January 19th, although if you sign up now, if you go to afterparty.org even before then, you can get early access to the course, but it will get national awesome. publication on, um, on January 19th. And then in April, 
middle of April, we have the book version coming out. So if you're somebody that's like, you know, our small group doesn't do video based curriculum, we do books, or I just, I want to read a book myself, or we've got a book coming out in mid April. And right around that same time, we've got our third leg a third big part of the after party, which is we have a worship album coming out. We're going nice. to called songs of the after party. Because as Christians, <laughs> that's a lot of how we embrace and get truth into our beings is we sing, we sing those truths. And so we want to supply some truths uh, in musical form around this vision of the after party of Jesus. Uh, and by the way, the after party has a double entendre. It means post-partisan, right? After the, so what, it's, it's beyond mm. the political party. Got it. Um, so nice. it's the after, but, it, but it also points to where our highest hopes for where, where we yeah. can believe is the restoration of all things, not through any human political party, but in the after party of Jesus, the wedding feast of the lamb, right? The feast that is to come when the king returns to restore all things to this world, to this earth, and to repair all that's broken, to beat the swords into plowshares, you know, and that's, that's what we look for. That's our hope. That is our confidence. And all of our political allegiances are humbled before that Jesus after party. Um, and so that's, that's what, that's the meaning of the term, the after party. Uh, and so, yeah, we invite people to, to join the movement, um, which is not around some partisan identity. It is around the after party of Jesus um, and do it through the course, the book that's to come and then the worship album. That's great. Well, man, to our listeners and to our watchers, thanks for joining us. Curtis, this has been Curtis Chang, Dr. Curtis Chang. Thank you so much for joining us thank today. You. It's been such a pleasure to have you on and you heard it. Please check out the website and check out everything with the after party. Um, we fully recommend that and hope that you guys will check it out. And until we see each other again, don't keep your conversations left or right but up. Thanks, guys, and God bless. See you later. Thank you.